So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Increasing Access to Opioid Agonist Treatment, an Innovative Cross-Sector Approach, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law. I'm Charles Strong, the Senior Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. A quick note that both the presentation slides and video playback for this webinar will be available on the Network's website shortly after the conclusion of today's event. We strongly encourage attendee participation and would love to hear from you. So feel free to submit questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is open up that tab, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, and send us your question. We'll be addressing them towards the end of today's webinar. Your moderator for today's webinar is Leslie Zellers. Leslie is an attorney with more than 20 years of experience in public health law and policy, for government and nonprofit organizations. Currently, Leslie works to advance public health and well being through ongoing legal and policy advocacy on issues such as tobacco control, cannabis regulation, and COVID 19. Leslie coordinated the work of the Cross Sectors Attorney for Health Collaborative. She'll be leading us through the rest of today's webinar. So, Leslie, over to you. Thanks, Charles. Welcome, everyone. We're really happy that you can join us. We have four speakers today, so I want to tell you a little bit about who they are, and then you're going to hear from them. And as Charles said, we'll have time at the end for questions. So first up, we're going to have hear from Donna Levin. Many of you know her. She's the National Director for the Network for Public Health Law, where she oversees strategy and operations. Before joining the network, Donna spent 26 years as General Counsel at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And her work these days is in the areas of newborn screening, genetics and privacy laws, health insurance, consumer protections, biotechnology, emergency public health response, healthcare and health cost care cost reform, and medical use of marijuana. After Donna, we're going to hear from John Sobotik. He's an attorney for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. He provides legal advice to the Division of Motor Vehicles on driver licensing, and he advises the divisions of motor vehicles, highways, and state patrol on matters related to traffic law. John worked in private practice for five years before joining the legal staff of the Department of Transportation in 1990. And as John will tell you, he is speaking today on his own behalf as a member of the Cross-Sector Attorneys for Health Collaborative and not on behalf of the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. After John, we're going to hear about the substance of the report from Kellen Rusinello. Kellen is a senior staff attorney with the Drug Policy Alliance, where he focuses on e increasing access to effective, accessible, and person-centered drug treatment. Prior to joining DPA, Kellen provided direct representation to people seeking post-conviction relief across Southern California with Community Legal Aid SoCal and staff attorney with the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties, where he focused on improving access to health coverage and services for people involved in or at risk of involvement in the criminal justice system. Last but not least, we are going to hear from Eric Gorovitz, who is a principal at the law firm of Adler and Colvin. Eric has extensive experience in lobbying and legislative drafting, policy development and media advocacy, and he's helped nonprofits and foundations across the country understand federal tax rules governing their advocacy activities. Eric has represented clients regarding nonprofit and foundation formation and governance, compliance with federal tax law, public policy advocacy, and the intersection of tax and election law. Eric, we just want to make sure that you are able to hear us and we are able to hear you. Could you say hello for us? All right, we might be having a few problems connecting to Eric, but I assure you we will work on it by the time his presentation is up. So first up, I'm going to turn it over to Don Levin. <laughs> Great, thank you, Leslie. And uh, thanks to all of you who are joining us for this discussion today. We are really excited to talk to you about using a cross-sector approach to a public health challenge and how this approach worked when we focused on increasing access to opioid agonist treatment. So at the Network for Public Health Law, we provide technical legal assistance how to use public health authority and law and policy to meet public health challenges. The premise for the cross-sector approach is simple. 
And it's perhaps not a groundbreaking idea, but in actuality, it's not often done. Health and the public's health depend on numerous factors at play and within the province of other sectors. So, for example, housing, criminal justice, education, et cetera. So one example is zoning. We public health lawyers don't usually know the ins and outs of zoning, but zoning law and policy play a role in affecting the public's health and health equity in determining the siting of substance use disorder treatment centers and the numbers of shelter beds available to those at risk of domestic violence and homelessness, the layout of neighborhoods, whether they are walkable and include recreational opportunities, which lowers the incidence of obesity and associated health problems. Zoning also affects whether communities are exposed to pollutants which adversely affect health and impact environmental justice. The question we asked at the network was, could we public health lawyers interest other non-public health lawyers to work with us to inform an overall law and policy approach to a public health problem? We reached out to other attorneys from other sectors, tried to recruit broadly, and the answer was yes. The promise of working together on an important public health issue resonated, and with a committed group, we considered where to focus. The group decided to address law and policy barriers and increase access to safe and effective opioid agonist treatment. It is safe and effective, but not as available as it should be. And um, with either methadone or buprenorphine, I always blow this, buprenorphine to prevent withdrawal and reduce cravings for opioids. And we're proud of the results, a collaborative, readable report with guidance on using policy and law to overcome barriers to opioid agonist treatment and a case study in how cross-sector collaboration works. So today, John, Kellen and Eric will share with you some insights into the cross-sector experience, its promise for future work, and also highlights of the findings and recommendations from the report. We're really looking forward to your questions, and we welcome your thoughts as well on what we could and should tackle next. And now with pleasure, over to you, John. Thank you, Donna. Um, uh, we can hit the next. There we go. From, Donna asked me to just talk to you about um, why I participated. Um, first of all, I think one of the things I brought to the table was a state government perspective. I have an insider's perspective on what government can accomplish well and what's going to pretend what what's going to present challenges. Um, and I, one of the things I like about the cross sector approach is that I've been involved in a number of things over the years. I have firsthand experience seeing narrowly crafted legislative solutions create problems, create solutions for one group and create problems in other areas. And it, I really appreciated the fact that a group, the, the, a group with too narrow a range of experience um, is going to miss things that a broad based collection of minds will catch. Um, I have no dog in this particular fight. For me, this is more of an academic and legal exercise in, in public service because I have no agenda or political perspective to advance in this arena. Public health is not my life, life's work. I'm a transportation lawyer and that's what I do. Um, but from a, a, a personal view in, in Wisconsin, the, the, the opioid problem is, is serious. Wisconsin has a an opioid misuse problem that's noticeably higher than the national average. The national average is about 4.1% of the population and here in Wisconsin, we're 4.7%. Um, why don't you hit the next slide, Donna? Yeah, so um, for, for me, I learned a lot more about opioid, opioid agonists and the regulatory structure for, for treatment. And I think I brought knowledge of my sector. I, I knew about transportation specific laws that affect things and particularly about barriers to travel. Next slide. So why is transportation relevant? Well, people need to be transported to treatment or the treatment has to come to them. 
Um, and that's just the basics. You need legal solutions that work both for urban and rural populations. Many of these people can't legally drive. Um, of course, if, you're, if you've are if you got a, a known addiction to the state, they'll probably suspend your operating privileges, so they aren't gonna be able to legally drive. Transit is often unavailable in, in rural communities or impractical in large urban areas. Um, you know, people can't take off work for four hours of bus rides to get to, the, to, to treatment. Um, voucher programs are limited. We, there are a number of uh, communities that have voucher ride voucher programs, but often those voucher programs are limited to specific segments of the population, veteran ride program or an elderly ride program, and they aren't open to the wide, um, the, the, the wide population that we have. And uh, of course, I mentioned already, in, in rural states like Wisconsin and in, in the flyover states, and, and even in States like California, it can be long, and New York, it can be a long distance between a rural community and a treatment center, somewhere where somebody lives and uh, and a treatment center. And, you know, there's a stereotype in, in the media that this is a, a strictly an urban problem, and that's clearly not the case. We see these problems. Um, opioid addiction is a severe problem in rural Wisconsin, um, uh, up, in, up in the up in the places where there there just aren't um, easy uh, and accessible treatment. Uh, next slide. Um, and why is transportation relevant? Well, I, I think there it's it's just that you know what are what am I seeing? COVID nineteen has reduced some of the barriers to tele to, to telehealth for addicted persons. I think Kellen's going to talk about that in his presentation. So I'm going to let him talk about telehealth and, and the other recommendations that we make in the paper. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kellen Rusinello with the Drug Policy Alliance. And uh, I'm going to be going through the sort of the, the body of the report um, and the recommendations that came out of this uh, cross-sector approach. So a little bit about uh, Drug Policy Alliance before I jump in. Uh, with a nation's leading organization working to end the war on drugs and to um, instill a drug policy that's based on science, compassion, health, and human rights. Some of the examples of, uh, of the work that we do uh, is uh, promoting health-centered drug policies in, uh, such as evidence-based treatment on demand, supervised consumption services, and syringe access programs. And we've also been involved um, in uh, reducing the role of criminalization in drug policy uh, most notably and recently in uh, the Oregon ballot initiative that decriminalized personal uh, possession um, in that state. And we're also been involved in the uh, efforts around the country to uh, regulate um, marijuana and, uh, and do so in an equitable and, and way that uh, addresses racial justice. So before we get to the recommendations, just, um, you know, as, as John was alluding to, the problem in, in Wisconsin, this is a this is a nationwide problem. And you can see by this chart, it's pretty staggering um, growth in the number of uh, overdose deaths involving any opioid, um, you know, particularly since 2010. Um, it's just sort of exploded. And part of that is due to um, use of um, or the uh, introduction of fentanyl into um illicit uh, drug supplies. Um, the fentanyl is a very highly potent opioid um, that is being mixed in with not only opioids, but also other, uh, other classes of drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine. Um, so nearly 50,000 people died from an overdose involving opioids in 2019. It's the largest cause of any unintentional injury death, um, more than vehicle accidents. Um, and just to break that down by day, it's about 130 people per day that die by, uh, from an opioid-involved opioid overdose. Uh, death rates are the highest in rural areas. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, the access problems for opioid access treatment in those rural areas. Um, but it's also, we're seeing uh, rapid increases in um, communities of color, particularly black and indigenous communities. Um, so there is a dire need for increased access to effective treatment that can help to reduce the uh, overdose death risk uh, associated with opioids. So what is opioid agonist treatment? 
Opioid agonist treatment is the use of medications that activate the opioid receptors and prevent withdrawal and reduce cravings for opioids. There are two FDA-approved OAT medications currently. One is methadone, which is a Schedule II controlled substance and is only available for the treatment of opioid use disorder through very highly regulated opioid treatment programs. And I'll talk more about those, the structure of those in a minute. The other medication is buprenorphine, which is a Schedule III controlled substance. And that is available through the opioid treatment programs or through a provider who receives what's known as an X waiver, which is sort of special permission from the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration to prescribe buprenorphine to folks um, with opioid use disorder out of their uh, doctor's office. So OAT is the safest and most effective method for treating opioid use disorder that we know of. It is uh, associated with reduced risks of all causes of death, including overdose. In fact, the studies indicate that it's about uh, you know, people who access OAT uh, can reduce their risk of opioid-involved overdose death by about half. Um, it reduces the use of other opioids, uh, reduces injection drug use, risk of HIV and hepatitis C, uh, risk of criminal legal system involvement, and it also helps lead to improved social functioning and improved quality of life. So these medications are very effective um, and uh, we need to get them into the hands of people um, so that they can benefit, but there are numerous barriers in the way um, that prevent that access. So as part of this approach, the, uh, the cross-sectors attorneys for health um, identified these different areas where uh, barriers exist. Um, so we focused on eight different areas here. Um, there are probably others that, that you know, we would love to include in, in future um, studies, um, but these were the top eight that came up that we discovered uh, numerous barriers within. And so as I go through the recommendations that are split, uh, that are divided into these various sectors, uh, just keep in mind that a solution that's been identified in one sector might have ripple effects in another sector. For example, if, if people are able to go to different types of facilities to access OAT, that's also going to that's going to impact how the healthcare system operates, but it's also going to impact transportation, for example, because people will be able to go to different facilities that may be closer to them. So just keep in mind that um, even though we split this apart by various sectors, um, this is meant to be thought of as a cross-sector approach where one solution will have impacts in, in other sectors as well. So starting with the healthcare system, um, there are numerous recommendations here and we start with um, repealing or reforming the requirements to access uh, particularly methadone through opioid treatment programs. So opioid treatment programs are, are highly regulated by the federal government and then even in many states, uh, even more regulated by state government. And um, essentially, because of the way that they are regulated, they are, uh, are traditionally a standalone facility. Um, you might hear the term methadone clinic. Um, that's what's referred to as an opioid treatment program. Um, and there are, so it's very, what the person needs to do in order to access medication through an opioid treatment program presents a lot of barriers. For example, New patients essentially need to go every day to the facility to receive their medication. Um, they need to submit to uh, frequent drug tests. They need to uh, often um, participate in counseling as well. Um, not, not just receive the medication, but also uh, participate in counseling in order to remain in the program. Um, and these, uh, you know, they, they can't... Uh, take home their medication until they've been in the program for uh, a certain amount of time. Um, under the federal regulation, it would be, you have to be in the program for uh, two years before you can um, take it at home for, uh, take a, 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 the amount for a month or month's worth of medication home. Um, so uh, obviously for people who have a lot of commitments um, or who live far from an opioid treatment program, this is going to be uh, very difficult to comply with um, to try and get back and forth and, and come for, do the drug tests and, and get the medication every day. 
So, uh, you know, our recommendation here is to repeal or reform the requirements to access it through that type of program. Um, and there, you know, it, if it was totally repealed, um, then people could potentially access methadone through their local pharmacy. You go to a doctor, their the primary care doctor, who could um, work with them and determine that that's the correct medication for them, and then they could fill it at a pharmacy like they would do with any other medication. Uh, so that would, uh, you know, obviously reduce a lot of the uh, barriers with going every day and, and transportation and all that and all that. Um, so uh, I'll jump to the next one, which is to repeal or reform the X waiver. So as I mentioned earlier, for prescribing buprenorphine, uh, providers can get an, what's called an X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine out of their office. Um, they must uh, complete a set amount of uh, educational hours in order to qualify, and then they submit their uh, application to the D Drug Enforcement Administration to receive that waiver. So this is, presents a lot of uh, barriers for providers to go through in order to actually get that waiver. Um, so we just we just don't have enough providers who are actually able to prescribe buprenorphine in the community. And this is particularly a problem in rural communities where about half of them just don't have access to uh, a provider who is uh, has an X waiver and can prescribe buprenorphine. So uh, our recommendation here is to repeal or reform that that would allow um, providers to um, prescribe to buprenorphine without uh, going through that additional training. Um, and to uh, another a component of the X waiver is that uh, providers are actually capped in, in how many patients they can serve once they have that waiver. Um, so in the first year, they, they can only serve 30. Uh, and then second year, that's 100. And then after that, they can serve up to 275. But they have to continually ask the DEA for permission to up that cap. Um, and it's just a lot of barriers for providers to go through. Um, so reforming or repealing it could address that and just say, you know, this would be treated like other medications where a prescriber can, uh, you know, prescribe it to anybody who uh, is in need, essentially, of this medication. Uh, so the third bullet point here is assuring state laws are more, more strict than federal requirements. As I mentioned, uh, opioid treatment programs are, are very strict at the federal level, the requirements for those. But some states go even further and, and, and enact uh, regulations or statutes that go beyond that. Um, so this would just essentially be working with states to get back down to the federal level. And if the federal level were to change and become more uh, allow for more access, then the state laws hopefully would follow that um, and allow people to have that access um, and not be restricted by the state regulations or statute. The next one is about uh, insurance barriers to, to OAT. So uh, oftentimes OAT will be, uh, uh, sometimes it's not even covered by insurance, which is obviously a huge barrier for people who uh, just don't have the money to pay for it out of pocket. Um, but sometimes when it is covered, it's subject to uh, insurance limitations like prior authorization or, uh, you know, fail first policies. Um, prior authorization essentially requires your insurance company to approve um, that you can get that medication prior to the, the doctor actually prescribing it, and making that available. Um, and for folks who are uh, have severe opioid use disorder and are seeking treatment, any delay can really um, hinder the chances that that person is actually going to successfully engage in treatment, even if it's just for a day or two, so that uh, the prior authorization can really get in the way of um, making sure that people get access when they, when they need it. And several states have passed legislation that um, actually prohibits prior authorization, both in state Medicaid and in private insurance programs. The next uh, bullet here is to expand access to um, and utilization of telehealth. Um, so obviously this will have a big impact in, in rural areas and in areas where transportation is an issue. Um, but as we've seen in COVID-19, there's been a lot of movement to make telehealth more available for a variety of things. Um, and that includes access to OAT. Um, so for both methadone and buprenorphine uh, temporarily under uh, while the public health emergency is ongoing, folks who are accessing those medications can uh, meet with their provider uh, using telehealth now. Um, 
the, for people who wa- want to initiate methadone, they still have to go in person to complete a, uh, an evaluation. But for buprenorphine, the DEA and, and SAMHSA have actually authorized that people can initiate buprenorphine via telehealth, including by telephone only where video is not uh, feasible. So um, this has led to a lot of innovation where um, people can have it increased access without actually having to go in uh, to see a provider and get that in-person evaluation. Um, and so, you know, essentially we need to be thinking about how do we make things like that permanent uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic comes to an end. Uh, we, we don't want to re- go back and restrict access to folks who um, had gained it. The next bullet point here is increasing connection to OAT and emergency departments. Um, so this is for folks who would come into an emergency department really for anything, but, you know, focusing on folks who come in for an overdose or substance use related issue, just making sure that there's the connection to uh, OAT in those emergency departments. It's, we want to make sure that people are getting connected to treatment in the moment they need it. Um, And, and emergency departments actually have the ability to initiate people uh, for 72 hours and get them connected. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, most many emergency departments don't do this um, and and states and policymakers can play a role in making sure that they do get these programs up and running. Uh, next bullet point is to expand the provider workforce and utilization and OAT utilization within it. Um, so this, I mean, this is a problem across the substance use disorder treatment spectrum generally, um, but thinking of our, our report lays out some solutions for, um, you know, building addiction training into curricula, uh, pr- providing funding for um, student loan reimbursement, those types of things, all designed to increase access to, um, the, to, to in- increasing the workforce so that there are actually providers able to prescribe these medications. Um, similarly, we want to, you know, utilize community health workers and peers um, who can be a crucial uh, uh, connector for folks who, who have opioid use disorder getting them into services. So coming up with funding streams and uh, sustainability for those types of positions uh, and getting them out into the uh, spaces where they are needed. And finally, um, the uh, would be to establish medical legal partnerships, which is uh, essentially these are partnerships between medical professionals and legal professionals to help identify um, legal underlying medical and underlying legal issues that the team can work with together Um, and come up with solutions for um, and get these two systems talking to each other um, so that you can really address all the needs of a person instead of doing it within silos and um, and, and not really realizing all the barriers that folks are facing when they when they access one of these systems. So jumping now to the criminal legal system. So our first bullet point here is to decriminalize possession of unprescribed methadone and buprenorphine. The research actually shows that folks who are using unprescribed methadone and buprenorphine are doing so in a way to self-medicate, primarily because access to these medications is so difficult. Um, And by throwing these folks into the criminal legal system, we're disrupting any progress or stabilization that this person may have been on the road to attaining. So uh, we need to think about whether that's the best approach or whether we should be um, you know, working to get people into the authorized system rather than punishing them for trying to self-medicate. We should also be uh, discussing expanded diversion programs um, and how those connect people to OAT um, with the idea of getting people out of the criminal legal system and connected to treatment um, so that we can um, stop the cycle and hopefully get people into a program that's going to work for them and reduce further criminal legal system involvement. The third bullet point here is uh, around requiring drug courts and other specialty courts to allow OAT. Uh, You know, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, um, based on your familiarity with the criminal legal system, uh, many drug courts don't allow folks to um, be on OAT if they're going to participate in the drug court program. Uh, And even for folks who are already on it, they might require them to taper off of it. Um, So... This is obviously counterproductive for folks who have opioid use disorder and are benefiting from those medications. So this uh, re- recommendation is uh, you know, designed to fix that issue. Um, it also is 
possibly a uh, violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act um, for folks who uh, have stopped using opioids and are using the opioid agonist medication to require them to stop um, might violate their rights under the ADA. Uh, similarly, access to methadone and buprenorphine in jails and prisons is, is very rare. Um, there are some bright spots, for example, in Rhode Island um, that has a program to make these medications available to folks in their unified jail and prison system. Um, but generally, its uh, access is, is very limited. So this uh, recommendation is, is to facilitate that access um, and then to continue that as people are released. As you can see in the next point, as people are released, to connect them with OAT providers in the community so that they can um, continue that treatment. Um, we're also talking about reducing returns to incarceration due to probation and parole violations. A lot of people end up back in incarceration um, because of technical violations, like they missed an appointment, that sort of thing, um, which can really disrupt any stability that a person has gained. Um, and, you know, because OAT is so limited in jails and prisons, if somebody is on it in the community and then is returned to incarceration for a technical violation, they're going to be disrupted from their medication. Um, and it's, it's, we're going to have some negative fallout from that. So trying to reduce the number of times that people return due to those violations. And then uh, finally here is to provide education for legal professionals. Um, this would include judges, prosecutors, public defenders, making sure everybody is uh, um, informed about OAT and how it can benefit people and uh, the need to get people connected with community-based providers rather than trying to incarcerate our way out of the problem. So our next uh, sector here is family law. So uh, we have three recommendations here. Similar to the drug courts in the previous section, um, some family courts don't allow participants, participants to um, be on OAT. Uh, so uh, again, this would be uh, allowing those people to have access to those medications um, and also to avoid any possible liability under, under the ADA for, for banning OAT access in those courts. A second point here is to prohibit custody removals and terminations of parental rights based solely on positive drug tests for OAT. Um, so, we, you know, there are instances where people where uh, mothers and fathers were using methadone or buprenorphine. The court didn't like this, viewed it as, you know, essentially using drugs um, and, uh, you know, sanctioned that person, whether it was the custody removal or term termination of parental rights. Um, so, you know, obviously that's not good for family stability and especially for people who aren't on OAT and are trying to um, get stabilized and you're using the medications that are right for them. Uh, you know, they shouldn't be punished for that. They, they should be, um, you know, they should be uh, encouraged to continue down that path and, and get stabilized. And the final bullet point here is to increase access to family centered OAT. Um, and this is essentially opioid agonist treatment programs that focus on families um, and provide additional resources for, uh, you know, mothers and fathers with young children. So would provide child care um, and, and additional resources um, to get those families the resources that they need and then so that they can continue in, in treatment as well. Moving on to housing. Our first... Uh, Recommendation here is to ease federal and state requirements to evict people for drug possession and use. Um, so federal um, and state laws can be pretty harsh um, for folks who are found to have um, possessed uh, or committed any sort of drug related offense um, within public housing. Um, and then they can be banned so they can be evicted and then banned for, uh, for, for years for, um, for that conduct. Um, but that actually increases, uh, you know, instability. Um, and especially for folks who have families, um, the whole family can, can be evicted. Um, so, you know, thinking of ways that we can ease this um, and get people connected to treatment rather than kicking them to the curb. The second point here is to increase partnerships um, between homeless service providers and OAT programs. Um, and this is, again, sort of, you know, like the cross-sector approach, right? We have people who are providing services to people who don't have homes, and we have the OAT programs. Many of the people might be accessing both services, but 
there's not often a lot of coordination between the providers. So trying to think of ways that OAT programs can work with those providers, whether it's coming there or providing transportation uh, or at least information and referrals um, so that people are aware of these services. Our third bullet point here is to prohibit recovery residences from excluding OIT. Recovery residents, um, they're also sometimes known as sober living homes. This is essentially uh, places for people who are trying to uh, abstain from drug and alcohol use um, for them to live while they uh, figure out their next steps. And uh, But a lot of them actually prohibit opioid agonist treatment within them um, because they see it as just another form of, of drug use. Um, but again, you know, this is, uh, you know, presents Americans with Disabilities Act uh, implications, and it also um, is going to hinder a lot of people who are trying to get stabilized, don't have a place to stay, and aren't allowed to stay there because, um, you know, they're, they're doing what's right for them and taking that, the medication that's right for them. And finally, here is support housing first and permanent supported housing approaches. These are um, approaches that provide housing to folks who have substance use needs uh, without requiring them to participate in any other services as a condition of that housing. Um, you know, obviously this would be partnered with uh, making resources available, including OAT, um, but this, uh, you know, this approach has, has shown very positive impacts in decreasing homelessness um, and uh, increasing health among people who have substance use needs. So more investment in those approaches is uh, required. Uh, so now we're gonna jump to zoning. This is where I thought things got um, pretty interesting in the report, because um, it's a little bit of thinking outside the box here. Um, so the first one is to require OAT access as a component in comprehensive development plans. So, um, you know, localities are, have to come up with these comprehensive development plans of how they're going to develop their city. Um, and it, uh, you know, states sometimes tell the localities what needs to be within those plans. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that they could do is say, well, you need to consider what are the opioid use disorder needs um, and uh, in your community and whether you need to have more opioid treatment programs or more, uh, you know, uh, providers that are going to be addressing this issue. Um, which would then require the localities to include in their plans whether they're going to cite more places for opioid treatment programs. Um, our second bullet point here is provide state review of opioid treatment programs citing denials. Um, so unsurprisingly, there's a lot of localities where uh, there might be hostile to opening uh, drug treatment facilities, including opioid treatment programs, and facing pressure um, local zoning authorities might deny citing uh, uh, an OTP in that area. And this would just, uh, uh, this would provide a way to challenge those um, determinations uh, and, and let the OTP, you know, essentially prove that, you know, the locality needs it um, as a way to uh, hopefully get past some of that, not in my backyard mentality that might otherwise prevent access and, in, in underserved areas. The third point here is um, allowing approval of OTPs without conditional use permits if there is an emergency demonstrated. So uh, again, this is a little bit in the weeds on zoning policy, and um, you know I would uh, recommend that you look take a look at the report. But um, this is um, if, if, if if there's an emergency that's saying you know overdose rates, opioid overdose rates in our area are so are getting out of control, we need more access to resources. Um, this would essentially allow a uh, locality to, to declare an emergency um, and then allow an opioid treatment program to open without going through all of the uh, usual uh, zoning requirements um, so that it can get up and running quickly. And then our final one here is, is just to ensure established laws enforced when necessary. And this is essentially, um, you know, where you would go to zoning attorneys and say, you know, we believe our locality is not allowing us to build an OTP, uh, in, which is contrary to their zoning law because they're allowing these other types of facilities to exist in this in this zone. Um, so working with um, attorneys to make sure that the established law is actually being enforced in areas where OTPs are being denied. 
So jumping to transportation. Uh, so our first one here is to increase mobile OAT provision. So um, there has been some movement in this due to, to the COVID-19 pandemic, which um, you know DEA and SAMHSA have allowed for uh, uh, delivery of methadone, for example, to patients who have to be quarantined. Um, they've allowed for a uh, OTP to establish an offsite um, sort of mobile thing, as long as it's going to the same place every day um, without separately registering as a separate OTP. Um, so um, there have been some movement in this, but there's a lot more that needs to be done in order to make sure that uh, the OTPs can actually go to people um, instead of requiring them to come daily. Um, so making sure that there are different options for folks who are just not able to reach an OTP or other provider, um, like an x ray provider, provider, making sure that there are mobile options for those folks. The second one here is to improve access to non-emergency medical transportation. Um, and this is a benefit under insurance and, and Medicaid that pays uh, for the transportation for people to get to treatment. Um, but there are actually several barriers to that one. You know, if OAT is actually not covered, then there's not going to be any medical transportation covered. Um, and then, you know, also states can sometimes not coordinate the, the benefit very well and uh, making it so inconvenient and to the point where it's essentially unavailable for folks. So working with policymakers to make sure that this act, that this um, benefit is actually available to folks and that it allows folks to get to OAT providers um, and access those services. The third one here is reducing driver's license revocations for reasons unrelated to road safety. Several states actually have laws that um, you know, require uh, driver's license suspension based on um, any amount of detectable uh, drug in the system, even if it's not related to road safety. Um, and some, some also, you know, your license can get re revoked when you're uh, convicted of certain criminal offenses that didn't have anything to do with, with road safety. And obviously this is gonna pose a barrier to folks who have to drive to get their medication, especially if they need to go every day. Um, so taking a look at these policies and reducing this where we can um, to make sure that people are actually able to go to uh, get to the services they need uh, while still maintaining uh, you know, road safety. So, and the last one here is obviously to increase public transportation options. If there are more ways for people to travel around and it's more convenient for them, um, it will make it easier for them to access treatment. Um, and this, so this can include, you know, bus and mass transit, uh, subway, train, all that. Our next sector here is education and youth. Um, so the first recommendation is to reduce the federal restrictions on youth methadone access. So the federal regulations are actually more strict for youth to access methadone. Um, they need to have tried uh, to detox and do um, drug-free treatment twice before they're actually eligible for methadone, um, which is, uh, you know, it, it can be dangerous actually um, because your overdose risk can increase once you have detoxed. Um, and it also is just, it just it doesn't seem to make sense when the evidence for um, methadone is so strong as, uh, as a, you know, an effective medication. So working on to, to reduce those restrictions in the federal regulations. Second point here is to increase access in college and university campuses. Um, this just makes sense for folks who, um, you know, they, the colleges and universities already have their own health systems. Um, and to make this available for folks, or at least have some sort of connection with local uh, OAT providers. It just makes sense, um, but needs more resources and, and uh, policymaker prompting to get that move off the ground. Third bullet point is, is to implement screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment. Um, and this is just to identify folks who may have issues, um, you know, for folks who come into access other college and university health system services, having a brief screening tool can help identify issues and get them connected to treatment, um, hopefully before some, some negative consequences occur. And the last one here is increased research on safety and efficacy in pediatric populations. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, the evidence for methadone buprenorphine is incredibly strong for adult populations, but not as robust in, in youth. Um, so we 
So more research should be done here to um, see if, see what's appropriate for youth as well. In employment, um, so our first bullet point is to enforce anti-discrimination laws. Um, and so this is essentially like, you know, people shouldn't be getting fired because they uh, are using medications like methadone and buprenorphine, or, you know, they shouldn't have to, uh, they shouldn't be um, fired or, or sanctioned because they have to go, that's, you know, if they have to go every day to get their medication, you know, finding a way to work with employers so that they can get their medication without um, being sanctioned. And the second one here is expand leave allowances um, to access substance use disorder treatment. Some states actually have a specific uh, leave program that allows people to take time off work to access substance use disorder treatment. Um, obviously, if this in includes some sort of pay, uh, paid leave, it would increase um, participation because some folks just can't afford to leave work in order to access treatment um, and, and they need that additional support. And finally, here in employment is to increase the use, the use of employee assistance programs. Most employers actually have employee assistance programs, but use among employees is, is low. Um, and so thinking of ways to try and increase people's use of these programs to access services, get help, um, and hopefully get connected to OAT if that is appropriate for them. And I think that with that one, we made it through all of the uh, recommendations in our report. I wanted to mention this because I would be remiss if I didn't. Um, so G Drug Policy Alliance has just released a new major initiative exposing um, the ways that the drug war has taken root in six critical systems. Many of these overlap with the ones that I've just mentioned. But if this is something, you know, if you're obviously here at this webinar, you're interested in this topic and the ways that this affects different sectors. So I would encourage you to check out uh, our Uprooting the Drug War project. And I have the link here at the bottom for you to do so. And with that, here's my contact information. I'm looking forward to any questions we may have. And I'm hoping we can pass it over to Eric, who can talk about how advocates can uh, work together to get some of these recommendations actually off the ground. Thanks, Kellen. Um, wave if you can hear me. All right, thank you. <laughs> Great. I had some technical difficulties and um, I am, uh, but I, I think I'm able now to interact and I appreciate all the heavy lifting the others have already done. Um, I am taking a somewhat different tack here. I am an attorney practicing um, in private practice. Uh, my background is in public health. Um, I, I did a, I studied law and public health together and spent the first half of my career um, as a public health policy advocate, uh, writing legislation and um, sort of being in the arena. And um, I now advise nonprofit organizations generally, but also with some specificity on their political engagement. Um, and so I'm very focused, very interested in the opportunities that public health, institutional public health, including charities and private foundation funders, and even uh, to a more limited extent, government have to engage in public policy debates and get into the arena um, to influence the outcome of public policy on issues like this. So my involvement in this group, um, which was a really remarkable experience, and I want to tip my hat to the network for, and, and to Donna and colleagues for um, seeing this opportunity and making it happen. Um, we had a long, as you know, long period of working together to uh, produce this report. And, and my engagement in it really had to do with helping to facilitate the, the cross-sector idea, the collaboration to uh, exert a, a sufficient pressure on the apparatus of public policy from lots of different directions that where we might not think of each other as allies in quite the, the, the way that we could. Um, I've done some of this work myself as an advocate and I've advised organizations around how to do it. And so my interest is really around um, highlighting for people the opportunities both for uh, non in the nonprofit sector 
and in interactions with government to for public health activists to be more present and more um, sort of broader thinking in how we collaborate. So uh, um, the, the primary issue, I guess, that that I have seen is that on the long list of recommendations that Kellen just went through, um, there are people who are interested in each one of those bullet points. And sometimes there might be people, somebody is working on transportation, somebody is working on youth employment issues, and they don't necessarily see themselves as collaborating on uh, opioid agonist treatment access. They see themselves as working independently and running into obstacles. The, the idea that's particularly intriguing to me that comes out of a report like this is it shines a spotlight on all the people that each of us could be working with to try to get to the same endpoint. And when we do that, we bring those voices together, even if we're coming from disparate interests and in different communities with different expertise, we might be able to make the same point about changes that have to happen in the and where the bus lines are located. Or, you know, somebody who's interested in youth employment and fo is focused on or, or, or employment based issues and is focused on things like time off to go get the, the medication. Um, you might be able to collaborate with somebody who, who you might not normally think of as an ally but who might see the value in increasing access to this kind of treatment for their own interests. And then you, you, you can put together um, a coalition that's much broader and has more power than if each of you is independently kind of speaking to your own interests. The other aspect of what I'm particularly interested in is the tax law rules that govern engagement in public policy. Um, and I am a, an aggressive proselytizer for the principle that uh, we have many more tools available to us than we use. I've done a little bit of research into this and hoping to flesh it out more, but a, a quick look, um, a sort of proof of concept study that I did uh, a year or so ago, or say now it was about a year and a half ago, um, sort of demonstrated that if you look at the, the permissible lobbying capacity of public health advocacy organizations, in the nonprofit sector, 501c3 charities and the organization that fund them, particularly operating charities, uh, we can calculate what their lobbying capacity is and we can see how much of that capacity they're actually using. And what we learned is that it's about 8% or so, five or 8%, depending on the kind of organization, which essentially means Organized public health is in uh, writ large. There are lots of counter examples that I don't want to. I don't want to um, uh, disrespect, but but writ large, organized public health is just not in the arena. We have much more capacity than we use to actually get in and 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 expressly talk to legislators about legislative policy that should be changing. There's a lot of misinformation about what charities are allowed to do and what foundations are allowed to fund. Um, and if we clear away that information, that misinformation, and change the perspective from the rules in the tax code, as they're most usually understood now as being a bunch of landmines and obstacles to our engagement in public policy, if we instead flip that and look at the tax rules as a roadmap of pathways and opportunities for us to engage in public policy, we have a lot more tools available and as a public health community, we're, we're right now not using those tools nearly enough. And this kind of cross-sector discussion creates an opportunity to leverage those opportunities in what I think of as very powerful ways. Um, and so I saw my role on this in this group as um, maintaining some focus on that issue and, and making sure that the report, which it does, mentions, refers to um, those opportunities. And now the task is to make sure that organizations um, that are working on these issues are pursuing clarity and uh, empowerment by understanding the rules and learning how to deploy them and expanding their ability to collaborate with allies. So I'm going to stop my diatribe there. 
um, and uh, sort of sit back. <laughs> if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you to all of our guests, John and Kellen and Donna. That was really fabulous. I'm really excited that we were able to get this great overview. Uh, Donna inserted in the Q&A panel the link to the report that Kellen um, was pulling the recommendations from. So we encourage all of you to read the report. I think it's a really wonderful example of bringing a lot of different sectors together to look comprehensively at a problem that is that has completely infiltrated society in a lot of different ways. And so these single focus solutions have not gotten us very far. So we have a lot of great questions in the chat box and the Q&A. Please go ahead and keep them coming. I'm going to start working through them. If we don't get to any questions during the, the webinar itself, feel free to follow up directly with the panelists afterward. So first question for Kellen is about... Um, what are the arguments and are any of them legitimate against making OAT available outside of a clinic setting? So if someone can get it at a, directly from a pharmacy, for example, what are the potential arguments about that? Um, so I would say generally the arguments against making OAT access more available comes down to concerns about diversion, um, that a, a person would get the medication and then sell it on the street. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned in my, in, as I was talking about the recommendations, the, the research shows that most people who are accessing it without a prescription are doing so as a means of self-medication, um, partially due to the fact that they have trouble accessing it through the regulatory system. So actually making it more available will bring people into the regulatory system um, and potentially even decrease diversion. Um, but making this, you know, the, the benefits of having people access this medication when they need it, um, you know, reduces overdose, reduces all-cause death. Um, the benefits so far so greatly outweigh um, these uh, fears about diversion that increasing access is, uh, you know, a priority. Great. Thank you. So one of the questions is kind of follows up on the telehealth issue. Um, someone writing in from the state of Maryland has a question about audio only for diagnosing and prescribing OAT. There's a, a bill pending there, and they're wondering about the potential problems with a provider not actually seeing the patient prior to uh, making the assessment. Right. Um, so, um, you know, again, I would say, you know, there's just fears about diversion here and, and the answer I just gave on that one. But what I will say about the benefit of audio only is that it, it has allowed some innovation um, during the pandemic that we haven't been able to have before. For example, in Rhode Island, the State Department of Health was able to create a sort of buprenorphine hotline where folks who uh, need to get access to the services can call a line and get connected with an x wavered provider. So one of the things it does is it opens up ways for people to connect, get connected with x wavered providers who might not otherwise be available in their area. And that's particularly important for rural areas where x wavered providers are very sparse. Um, but also, you know, as we think about expanding telehealth, there are just a lot of people who still don't have access to broadband or, um, you know, smartphone and, uh, and are unable to do the video component of it. So, uh, you know, if they don't have access to that, then essentially they wouldn't be able to have access to it by telehealth. And if they can't do it by telehealth, it's unlikely, you know, that they'd be able to, to access it in person as well. Um, so for those in rural areas and those for with, with low income, the audio only option actually expands uh, availability uh, by quite a bit. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that really reinforces the connections in other sectors. I mean, we're obviously seeing it through the COVID pandemic, school children and all kinds of issues with internet access and, and broadband access. So we are, we're seeing some positive progressions, but it's also highlighting some greater uh, infrastructure problems. So Eric, uh, you have one fan among the audience who really enjoyed what you had to say, and she'd like to know where we can find more information. Um. Well, thank you. There are all kinds of places. One one place 
So, I mean, we I, we have some a few materials on our website at Adler and Colvin. Um, I advise a huge number of organizations about this, and I'm happy to have um, the sort of initial conversations with anybody. Um, Alliance for Justice has lots of good information for that's available in reports um, that they've done that explain the relevant tax rules. Um, those are a sort of high level overview. Um, and uh, that's a good place to start. They actually do trainings as well. Um, and I, so I think those are the best resources to begin. If you want to, um, if you have specific questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. You can reach me at egorovitz at adlercolvin.com. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to answer questions directly if, uh, if you have some. Let me take myself off mute. We will try to put those resources in the um, in the chat box here, so you guys have ac easy access to Eric's email and the website for his firm. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, lots of really good questions. Okay, so here's an issue. Um, we're talking about access to opioid agonist treatment. Um, the person has a question about, are there guidelines for bringing people off this medication? Obviously, we want people to be able to access it in order to address their problems. But um, he's wondering, are there also resources and guidelines for people who are ready to come off? Um, yeah, I can respond. So I'm not a clinician, um, so I can't, you know, say, but there are clinical guidelines for uh, tapering off these medications. Um, and of course, it will all be individualized and you may need to go back and forth a little bit to, to meet the needs. But essentially what the research shows is that um, indefinite uh, opioid agonist treatment is the most effective treatment. So we're talking about people who potentially might be on this medication until the end of their life. Um, and so they need to have access to that medication. And the research shows that doing so is actually what's going to produce the most beneficial um, impacts. Um, so for people who do want to get off the medication, you know, obviously that's their choice and, and they can work with their, uh, their doctor or, or provider to, to do that safely. Um, but what the research shows is that this medication needs to be available and, and essentially, it, you know, treated as a chronic uh, health issue, much like, uh, you know, diabetes, where people will need to have access to medication throughout their lives. Isn't this is John, isn't it the case that, you know, some people that are become addicted to opioids that actually their brain chemistry is actually changed and they then need to have um, that. that inspires the need for the uh, treatment for, for an extended period or for life. Yeah. I mean, the, the neuroscience behind it is very complicated, but yes, um, you know, you are right. There are changes going on due to, due to drug use, but there are also changes going on to due to every sort of learning behavior that we do. Um, so uh, it's very complicated, but, but yes, I mean, essentially people will need this medication um, to help stabilize themselves. Um, and, and for many people, it will be uh, lifelong. Okay, I'm just going to take myself off mute because I just keep asking questions here. We have tons of great questions. I'm going to keep moving through. Kellen, can you talk about efforts by the previous administration to remove the X waiver and what's the status under the current administration? Sure. So in the last week or so of the, of the Trump administration, the Department of Health and Human Services issued this uh but we're going to be new practice guidelines that essentially removed the X waiver training requirement and would have allowed uh, physicians only to uh, prescribe up buprenorphine to up to 30 patients um, without going through any sort of additional training and need to get approval from the Drug Enforcement Administration. Um, so basically what happened, uh, at, at least my understanding was um, this came up, it was like a week or two before the administration changed. And the Biden administration came in and said and retracted the practice guidelines um, and, and cited, um, you know, that 
wasn't done through the proper channels, regulatory channels, essentially. Um, and so we expect there will be something on this very soon. Um, uh, actually, just today, there was the reintroduction of the of the MAT Act, which would eliminate uh, the, the X waiver requirement. But we do also believe that the Biden administration is going to have some movement on the X waiver issue. They cited it in their um, documents when it was candidate, when he was uh, running um, for president, um, and it included a citation to a paper that essentially called for removing the X waiver. So we do expect there to be motion. Um, it's just a matter of going through the proper regulatory process um, and uh, dealing with all the other issues that an incoming administration has to deal with. I think you're muted. There, there we go. There's relate, sorry, there's a related question, which is a little bit broader, which is what are the chances for large scale reduction of federal requirements on using methadone? <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, methadone is just harder to, to, to get progress on. Um, we've seen a lot of discussion around buprenorphine, even with the relaxation of um, regulations under COVID-19. It's been more, um, uh, there have been more relaxing, relaxations for buprenorphine than there have been for, for methadone. Um, so, uh, you know, I think getting rid of the entire OTP system is, is still a little bit further off, but I'm hoping that there's going to be um, uh, action to make methadone more available, um, you know, for those folks who would benefit from that medication. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, maybe you could share a few thoughts. We're talking here about actual policy changes, either at the Fed. Th these ones we're talking about have to be at the federal level. There are lots of recommendations in the report that concern policy changes at the state level or local level or through policies of organizations such as jails or hospitals. Um, what are some tips for how advocates can help mobilize to push those changes forward? Well, I think the most important thing is to understand what your capacities are and to um, identify allies who add to those capacities. So um, in my own work as a, as a public health advocate um, on a number of issues, um, one of the most important lessons I learned, and I'm sure there are many, many people on this call who already know all of this, but um, one of the most important lessons I learned is the, the value of having the right speaker um, deliver a message. And, and sometimes the advocate isn't the right speaker, uh, depending on the community or what you're trying to accomplish. So I could imagine, for example, if I were concerned about access, there could be some real value in having somebody like Kellen or somebody like John deliver a particular aspect of the, of the message or communicate with a particular decision maker rather than me doing it myself. And so building those a sort of web of allies across all of these sectors is a really good way to increase um, to increase reach beyond your organization's own natural constituency. Um, and then understanding what you're actually allowed to do and making sure you have resources available to do it, um, I think it's also important. I think there's a lot of self-regulation that's based on misinformation um, about how particularly um, organizations in the nonprofit sector can leverage their resources to influence policy. Regulatory strategies are not lobbying, um, are not legislation, and so they're not subject to the limits on lobbying. Um, a lot of people don't understand that. Zoning commissions and planning commissions and health commissions School boards are not legislatures, and the decisions they make are not subject to the restrictions on lobbying. Um, there are exceptions in the rules that define what counts as lobbying for federal tax purposes that, if properly used, can allow a charity using private foundation money that says, you know, with a grant that says you cannot use our money for lobbying, a charity can use that money to write a report that addresses, that discusses the issue and includes model legislation. And they can hand that report, including the model legislation to legislators because the report counts 
as an exception for what's called nonpartisan analysis study and research. Um, so understanding those rules and how to deploy them uh, is a very powerful way to amplify the voice. And self-serving though it sounds, having been in the in the nonprofit sector and a client of the firm where I now work for many years, um, I, I believe in the value of um, having in your corner someone who really understands these rules. Uh, and there are a lot of people out there who do and making sure that you have access so you're not to, to good information about what you can and can't do, cannot do, so that you're not overly tying your own hand. Yeah, those are great points. And I think the who's delivering the message issue is also something for people who work for local or state governments to keep in mind. Often, if you're a government employee, there are many things that you are not allowed to do, even though you might personally feel very strongly about them. And so working with those in the nonprofit or community groups or residents or concerned citizens in order to help deliver that message can really help amplify your voice, I think. I think that's a really important point, and I've seen it used extremely effectively by people in government to make sure that messages that they're not able to deliver get delivered when they need to. I want to get to a couple questions about existing law, the Americans with Disabilities Act. These, I think, probably are for Kellen. Um, someone had a question. I, I think it really goes to the definition of a disability. So what, for someone, um, people with substance use disorders, what qualifies as a disability? And then there's a related question about how much discretion um, authorities have about applying the ADA. The, the question happened to be particularly in terms of tenancy, but um, so we're talking about an existing law and how much discretion do people have to comply with that if there, if there are problems? <laughs> Right. Um, so the definition of disability under the ADA does include people who have are in recovery from a substance use disorder. Interestingly, it does not include people who are currently using illegal substances um, and have a substance use disorder. They have to have stopped using and to and to be in in recovery. That does include people who are use using opioid agonist treatment like methadone and buprenorphine. They will be considered to uh, have a disability and have protection under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, in terms of who has leverage or who has the ability to, um, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting how you phrased it, Leslie, but um, you know, leeway and how they apply the, uh, uh, the ADA, uh, it's not my area of expertise. Um, you know, a, an uh, organization that does a lot of work on this issue is the Legal Action Center. Um, enforcing folks' uh, rights under the ADA who have um, past substance use disorders. Um, so I'd encourage you to check them out. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say generally the ADA is pretty uh, expansive in, in who it covers um, and, and those rights uh, that people are able to assert also apply to um, housing. Thanks. Um, here's a transportation question, which is potentially for Kellen or for John. It's a question about a Supreme Court case in New York City Transit Authority versus Beaver. Um, I'm not familiar with the case, but apparently the court upheld the Transit Authority's policy to not hire people who are receiving methadone treatment, and whether that's um, constitutional. What's, what's been the trending case law since that case? I'm not familiar with the case, um, but you know, in general, and, and I guess it would. You know, I would just thinking about it, it would depend on what what capacity the person is working in. But in general, the you know transit and um, and trucking are very highly regulated industries um, where people are operating machinery that can you know potentially injure um, thousands, you know, hundreds or thousands of people. So um, it it wouldn't surprise me if there are stronger restrictions on persons. Um, both you, you know, current users of drugs, people who are using drugs, or people who are um, who are uh, uh, in, in treatment, it just it just wouldn't surprise me at all. They're very highly regulated industries. Yeah, and I'm I'm not super familiar with sort of the the 
progeny of Pfizer, um, what cases have been you know, citing it. But, uh, you know, that, what, that case was decided in the 1970s and the ADA was passed in the 1990s. So I think somebody who would be bringing a case today would have new claims under the ADA um, uh, protection under, under disability law. Okay, great. That's good context. That's why I had no idea what the case was. It's quite old. Um, all right. So in terms of expanding the group of allies, there's a, a really a comment here more than a question about the person notes that increasing support to, for families is a good one. And um, they want, would like to recommend considering including caregivers in that she's a, supporting a relative who, who receives OAT. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great recommendation, um, you know, particularly for folks, um, you know, that aren't able to go, but have somebody who maybe could be able to go pick up their medication for them. Um, there have some actually COVID-19. There's been some regulation uh, relaxation for folks who are in self-quarantine um, and unable to leave the house to have a caregiver um, help get the medication Um so, I, yeah, I think that's a great recommendation and something we should consider. And then there was a, another question about what about court ordered um, OAT looking at it? But would that would that help in terms of access for people who are in the criminal legal system? Uh, so, I mean, generally our position here is that judges aren't medical professionals and so they shouldn't be ordering the type of treatment people get. Um, but they certain, certainly also shouldn't be prohibiting the type of treatment that people get. So if somebody is going to be court ordered to treatment, it should be up to the health professional and the individual to determine what the right course of treatment is for that individual. Okay. So we had another question. Of, you mentioned earlier on, Kellen, about emergency departments linking people with OAT. And there's a question about, um, is there a recommended care package that the emergency departments send with discharged clients when they're leaving the hospital? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I'm not aware of a resource that's like the care package, um, but there are a few examples to look into. Um, the California Bridge program has a lot of resources available on their website and is focused on connections from EDs to community-based care. Uh, I believe Massachusetts also has a similar program and maybe New York. Um, but, uh, you know, what's really important um, uh, in a lot of these programs are trying to emphasize is including a peer actually embedded in the emergency department, who can be that liaison that actually connects that person into the community uh, treatment um, and, and serves as sort of their advocate for getting in, in, into uh, connected into the treatment in the community. And, and I think that's a really promising model. Um, and, you know, the, the more we can get warm hands offs like that instead of, you know, here's the flyer, I, I think is better. Yeah, right. So we're really kind of speaking to this whole community approach. And there was another, um, Eric, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about potential allies. There was a comment about potential allies could be law students working with student attorneys at health rights legal clinics across the nation. We we're just talking about caregivers in addition to family members and then these community organizations working with clients who are leaving the hospital. Can you say a little bit more about kind of building those alliances in order to advocate for potential policy change? Well, yeah, I think there are some good models for for how to do that. One one that I um, have a very close experience with was uh, an effort in the city of Berkeley, California, where I lived for many years, um, to uh, impose uh, tax on sugar sweetened beverages. It's another another topic that people in this group may be aware of or interested in. Um, the alliance that came behind that. Um, was really remarkable. It was a collection of, on the one hand, parents from well, well, relatively um, high income um, communities, relatively low density of people of color in those communities that were interested in funding nutrition education in the public schools. Then there was a group of um, people from a different area of town that were interested in addressing obesity. 
Then there was a group of people that was interested in questions of food justice and, and nutrition generally. And they, they all came together in a, in a really remarkable way that, that sort of covered all of the different interests. And they all focused their attention for very different reasons, but in a, in a tightly coordinated way, focused their attention on this policy. And the result was when the, the corporate opposition to this policy, which was extraordinarily heavily funded, came into this little town and put $2 million into opposing a local ballot measure, um, which was, I think by then, I, I think up until then, the biggest expenditure on a ballot measure had been about $180,000, and this was about $2 million. Um, uh, they, had no, they had no traction at all, because every single community in town, for different reasons, had signed on to this issue. And, and, and all of that coordination happened before the ballot measure was introduced publicly. So it was all kind of behind the scenes. And when the public discussion began, there was already a coordinated message, a unified position, and all of the relevant constituencies had been inoculated against the counter arguments that were predictably going to come their way. Um, and it was a very effective strategy and the measure passed with 75% uh, public support, so, or more. Um, so that example I, is, is a very instructive example. Um, I've also done the, done work on this. I, I worked in gun violence prevention for many years and had situations where, for example, a um, an elected official from a certain part of the state that was relatively more conservative wasn't particularly interested in hearing from gun violence prevention advocates, but was very attentive to the views of her city's chief of police. And we had access to the chief of police through another organization and and got the chief of police to deliver the message that we needed this state legislator's support um, rather than having advocates who were not as persuasive in that community uh, as the police chief deliver that message. And we got her vote. Um, so it's it's that kind of thinking ahead and 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 the power that I see in the report. Um, that we just went through is that it identifies all of the potential different voices that you might be able to recruit if you're trying to address the zoning piece or the bus lines piece or the employment law piece of this issue. Employment law advocates may not be the best messengers to get a particular vote. It may be that you need somebody whose interest in access to OAT comes from a completely different place but they see the value in using your issue to advance their cause. So if you can all collaborate ahead of time, use it just using the, the different topics that are set out in the report as a guide for who to go talk to about who your, who your allies might be, that's where the new opportunity presents itself. Great. Thank you. I mean, I think that's really one of the big motivating factors that brought us all together to work on this issue. And Donna, I wonder if you could say something. Uh, Eric gave an example that just talked about sugar sweetened beverages and, and gun violence. Could you talk a little bit about how this approach of bringing attorneys together who work in different sectors might be applied to other public health issues? Oh, thanks. Right. So, um, a couple of the other uh, issues that we discussed as possibilities with the cross-sector uh, group when we came together, uh, one was uh, specifically asthma, but you could think of uh, housing conditions broadly, uh, health harming uh, conditions uh, with respect to safe and healthy housing. Uh, we thought about physical activity and possibly all the ways different sectors could come together to help transform communities along those lines and neighborhoods uh, for greater access to activity and et cetera. Um, there's one that I've been thinking about that has come about post COVID. Uh, it's clear that um, in all the emergency 
preparedness that we've done, we have not covered really the basis on the economic fallout um, from that, and that it may be uh, a, a good opportunity for cross-sector work to think about all of those uh, ramifications, and um, many of which have, uh, you know, just um, highlighted the disparities in terms of worker protection and um, the safeguards for for workers and for families, um, whether it's food or otherwise existing during an emergency. So that's another. But um, I take this opportunity to. Uh, it's not an easy lift to do this, but I think we're encouraged by what we were able to do with this report. Um, and if you have any ideas uh, for the network or are interested, let us know. Thank you, Donna. I appreciate it. Um, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, Kellen, there's another one for you that had a question about, are there restrictions about you using telehealth across state lines? Um, yes. Uh, so, yeah, generally, um, I'm, I'm not a super expert in telehealth, um, but my understanding is that um, typically a, a doctor who's licensed in one state needs to practice within that one state. Um, and so they could use telehealth within that one state. However, um, Due to COVID, there has been a relaxation that allows um, providers to have sort of like a reciprocity with other states that that say it's okay. Um, and then they can uh, work with patients that are in other states. Um, so, and that actually also applies to, to buprenorphine, um, at least during the extent of the public health emergency. Um, so, um, but it's something to think about, right? Like, for example, where in, you know, in maybe in the middle of the country where there aren't X waiver providers. Um, how do people get access to those? Um, so thinking about ways like how you know can you do telehealth with a provider who is out of state um, since you don't have access within state? I think that's an important consideration. Right, we definitely see that in Wisconsin, in far northwest Wisconsin, people go to the cities or to Duluth for these services. They don't get them from people on our side of the border. And John, last question, I think we have time for this might be a question for you. Um, a question about what's going on in terms of driver's license standards. Colin mentioned potential revocations for reasons unrelated to road safety. Well, there's a federal statute, 23 U.S. Code 159, that allows it, it, it requires states to revoke driver licenses of persons convicted of any drug offense. But it has an opt out provision that was put into it in the mid 1990s. And most states now, I think a majority of states now have opted out. Um, uh, there's a, a pretty strong minority that have not. Um, and what you need to do to, to opt out is your legislature needs to pass a resolution. And then every year, your governor has to certify to the federal government that he doesn't believe that the law is a good idea. Um, our governors have been doing that for about 15 years now, um, uh, opting out. Um, and generally, it's just that the, the problem with the federal law is that it's so strict. Um, we, we allow our courts to suspend a person's operative privilege if the court thinks it's appropriate for a non-driving drug offense, um, but we don't mandate it anymore. And we saw the number of revocations drop from huge numbers, I mean, tens of thousands down to virtually zero. Um, there are very few that that, re, that, that have that. Um, so that's that. And then the other issue is the medical review process. So drivers are assessed medically if they're an addict by a staff in the state, in the state driver licensing department. Um, for us, it's our DMV. Um, other states might be the secretary of state, but they are assessed in some fashion and a decision is made about whether they're appropriate, to, whether they can be appropriately licensed. And those are really uh, treatment related, um, sort of occup uh, occupational therapy type questions. Are these people fit to drive a motor vehicle? And for in Wisconsin, a panel of doctors oversees that. So 
the, the person will get a decision and then they can appeal it. They don't need an attorney and uh, a group of doctors, three doctors uh, in a panel will oversee what they um, what they have. You know, they're they'll look at their uh, uh, medical records and make a decision for them, uh, hopefully tailored to their circumstances. So that's a state by state issue. And each state has to do that itself because driver licensing in general is a state function. Thank you, John. So I want to thank all of our panelists. This has been a really great opportunity to learn more about the report. We encourage you to take a look at it. If you haven't already, we have the link in the Q&A panel. Also, you will be getting a follow-up email if you register for this webinar. We'll have the link to the, um, the slides and also um, to the report that we'll make available to you. And we really encourage everyone to take some action to the extent that you're able through education or potentially advocacy to move some of these issues forward. And thank you everyone for participating and thank you to our panelists.